Now you were born in South Dakota. I was born in Avon, South Dakota, a little town of 600 people. Um, I was there a couple of years ago and there's a sign as you go into town that says Avon 601. So they've picked up one person since I left. Of course, when I'm there, it's 602. What was growing up in Avon, South Dakota like? Corn, hogs, wheat, rye, barley, dairy products. It was a diversified uh, agricultural area and a very abundant one. Your father, you were literally a son of a preacher man. I grew up in a parsonage. My dad was a Methodist minister. Um, he was of Irish uh, descent. Most of the uh, McGoverns were <clears throat> devout Catholics, but my father's branch somehow ended up as Methodist. He was assigned by the church to uh, South Dakota and spent the rest of his adult life there. He died hunting pheasants in South Dakota. Some of the churches that he built are still standing, aren't they? They are. My, my father literally was a church builder. Uh, he had carpentry skills. He knew how to put in electric wiring and plumbing. And so he would take charge of a parish that didn't have an adequate church. He'd organize the men, many of whom would volunteer their labor, and they would put up a new church. Or they'd take over an old one and remodel it. And he uh, is responsible for several churches that are still standing in South Dakota. What you were saying before about he being part of the Protestant wing of the McGovern family, I guess there's kind of a string of contrarianism that runs way back in your background? Well, the McGovern Irish go back to County Cavan or County Leitrim. Um, I went there uh, some years ago and talked to an old sheriff, a former sheriff, and he invited me to his house for dinner. I said, what kind of people were these McGoverns? Well, with his Irish blarney, he said, well, they were kind of a shifty people. Uh, secondly, they were a litigious people. They were always taking others into court, and they became their own lawyers in court. I said, well, Sheriff, sure, wasn't there anything good about them? Well, he said they were all big talkers. They could get up and speak forever. So then after about a half an hour, he started to laugh, and he said, well, my mother was at McGovern. Uh, they're wonderful people. He said, I was just giving you a little of the old Irish Barney. So I felt better about it after that. But I do have a big streak of Irish uh, blood in me, a little Scotch blood, too. Growing <clears throat> up in South Dakota, rural South Dakota during the Depression, describe what that was like. Well, we were all poor, and consequently, we didn't know we were poor. There was nothing to compare yourself to. There weren't any rich people in South Dakota in the 1920s. The crash of the stock market in 29 signaled for most Americans the beginning of the Depression. Not so in South Dakota and the Great Plains. The Depression there began in 1920 and 21 at the end of World War I. We had gone into all-out production, plowed up land that probably never should have been plowed. And uh, when the war ended, the markets collapsed. Corn, wheat, barley, oats, all those things went down to, you could hardly give it away. So the banks started to fail, the stores started to fail in rural America because the farmers were losing their farms. Then the drought came, then the grasshoppers. It was a difficult time, but as I say, I had a good time growing up in the 1920s and early 30s, even though the Depression was on, because everybody was pretty much in the same boat. We, we helped each other. I remember my dad, as a minister, sometimes would get paid with a 100-pound sack of potatoes or a three or four dressed chickens or tomatoes, cucumbers, and so on. People didn't have money, and they had to use what they had to, to help each other out. Required a certain amount of grit, a certain amount of pluck to be able to survive during those times in South Dakota? You know, the uh, commentator, Tom Brokaw, who incidentally grew up in South Dakota, a good friend of mine, uh, wrote this book, The uh, Greatest Generation, which was my generation. Now, if we were the greatest generation, I'm not sure we deserve that 
compliment. Part of the reason was that we toughened up during the Great Depression of the 1920s and 1930s when we were going through school and getting ready to graduate in high school. Then, of course, we went off to war. It was the combination of the Depression and World War II that I think made our generation a particularly hardy and imaginative one. You were very young when Charles Lindbergh completed his historic flight. Five years old, but he was a hero. I was old enough to know that this was the greatest man in the world, that's what we thought at the time, to make that flight all alone across the uh, Atlantic Ocean, the first human being to do that. <clears throat> he was a hero to everybody. So even at the age of five or six, I knew all about Lindbergh. <clears throat> and I suppose if you traced it back, maybe that's where my interest in flying began. Is there any way for people <clears throat> nowadays to understand the level of celebrity that Lindbergh enjoyed after that? I don't think so. I think that the um, ticker tape parades, the wild celebration in Paris when he landed, we didn't have television then, but we did have newsreels at the theater, and we had radio, and we had the headlines in the press, and we had the great photographs. I can't recall anything in my lifetime that rivaled the uh, celebrity status of, uh, of Charles Lindbergh. As a young child, really, what was it about Lindbergh that attracted you? Was it the, the bravery? Was it the glamour? Was it just that he, he was able to do this and it was so far apart from your experiences growing up? I think it was partly his youth. Uh, he was a big, tall, gangling youth, and he did it alone. It wasn't a crew. He was in that airplane all alone, uh, droning away over the uh, Atlantic Ocean in both dark and, and sunlight. Uh, and he did it the first time. It was a great success. He had a wonderful name for the plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, I guess it was called. But I think it was sort of the lone man against the whole world. And he conquered a big piece of it as a single individual. I think that was partly that. In The Wild Blue, Stephen Ambrose talks about how you, in seventh grade, were challenged by your gym teacher to do to jump over the, the uh, horse and mm -hmm. do a head first. Could you relate that story? I was probably, um, I don't know, maybe 13 years old, 13 or 14, and we had a coach. He was a wonderful coach by the name of Joe Quennell. I, I greatly admired him, as did the other boys. We didn't have girls' athletics to speak of in those days. Uh, but we were also all afraid of him. He was a very tough taskmaster. And in our gym class, uh, he would have us engaged in what was rather advanced tumbling exercises. And one of the things was to run at top speed across the gymnasium floor, leap over a horse, maybe four feet off the floor, tuck your head and roll on the mat on the other side of the horse. I could not do that. I'd run up to that horse and I'd stop, stand there. The whistle blew. It was Joe Quentel. What the hell is the matter with you, Mac? I said, well, Mr. Quentel, I can't do that. I just can't dive. I'll break my neck. He said, you see these other boys doing that? I said, yes. He said, you know why you can't do that? You're a physical coward. God, imagine that in front of 75 or 80 guys. It just cut me right to the quick. And, um, you know, for days after that, I was uh, hurt and demoralized by that comment. I thought I had forgotten it when I got to high school. But um, a year later in college, uh, when World War II came, the attack on Pearl Harbor, I was one of the first to volunteer after Pearl Harbor, and I went into what I thought was the most dangerous part of the Air Force, which was flying a bomber in uh, combat. I think I did it in part to show Joe Quentel that I wasn't a coward. I couldn't jump over that horse. I still can't today do that. I'd break my neck, I think. 
but I wanted to show him I wasn't lacking in courage. That was probably a subconscious urge on my part, but I believe it was a significant one. What was your childhood like, General? I had a good childhood. I never doubted once the love and devotion and trustworthiness of my mother and father. They were incapable of a falsehood. They were uh, incapable of hypocrisy. They were honest, decent, uh, God-fearing uh, parents who gave us everything they had. Uh, they made it possible for us to get a good education in a secure uh, home atmosphere. There were some things that were a little difficult. My father insisted on every morning before we went to school, we had to go in the living room. All four of us children sat around with my mother and father. My father read a chapter out of the Bible and then prayed for the safety and well-being of each one of us. At the time, I felt it was kind of difficult. Looking back on it, it was probably the best thing that could have happened to me. I can still, to this day, quote, verses in the Bible, pro probably easier than almost anyone in public life. It's that early childhood upbringing. I soaked up a lot more of the Bible than I probably realized at the time. Do you think in America, and this is a little bit of an aside, but do you think in America nowadays we've lost a lot of, of that, not just the Bible, but of the daily interaction parents and kids? I think we have lost a lot of that daily uh, reaction, partly because now uh, in many families, maybe a majority, both the mother and father work outside the home. I'm not condemning that. I think it's almost necessary economically for many families these days. My mother never worked outside the home. She was always there when we left for school. She was always there when we came home. That made a difference in uh, the way children were read, in my opinion. Uh, I don't blame women for wanting to be emancipated from housework and getting out on their own. That's part of modern society. But we haven't quite yet figured out how to take the place of uh, mothers and fathers in the home. Of course, my father was in the home a great deal, too. His study, as he called it, was upstairs in our house. That's where he prepared his sermons. That's where he met with his parishioners. So I think that's a, an enrichment in childhood that we haven't quite yet figured out how to replace. Where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was at home. It was a Sunday afternoon, Mitchell, South Dakota. I was a, um, a, a sophomore at Dakota Wesleyan University, located in my hometown. And I was taking a class in music appreciation where the instructor, Bob Brown was his name, from uh, Oberlin College, uh, he required us on Sunday afternoons to listen to the New York Philharmonic. And then we were supposed to write a critical review. Imagine a high school sophomore saying that, you know, we'd put down whatever came, but we'd like to have a little more percussion here and a little more violins here. We didn't know what we were talking about, but we sounded good. And that's what I was doing, trying to figure out how I would improve the New York Philharmonic. And then came the interruption, the attack on Pearl Harbor. I didn't have the foggiest notion where Pearl Harbor was. I certainly didn't know that half the American Navy were there, but we soon discovered that half the American Navy and the big battleships and other uh, fighting ships were sunk that day. It was a terrible blow to the uh, military security of the country. But I could tell looking at my father's face that this was a deadly serious basis. No television then, it was just the radio uh, reports. And somehow by the end of the afternoon, I figured I was going to be involved in war. I didn't quite know how or even how it worked, but I think by 6 o'clock that night on Sunday, December 7th, I knew I was, I was going to be involved in war sometime in the near future. <clears throat> Did that prospect scare you? It didn't scare me um, entirely. It, uh, it alarmed me, but I also thought it would be an important adventure. You know, um, there was never any doubt after that in America that we'd be involved. The next day, President Roosevelt asked for a declaration of war. Uh, 
and the Congress speedily uh, voted it, uh, I knew all the more then that I'd be involved at some stage. I figured I would volunteer, and uh, that was the course I took rather soon. <clears throat> you felt it as a personal obligation, a patriotic act, a way to prove that you wasn't, weren't a, a physical coward? I, um, I felt it was a patriotic duty. The country had been savagely attacked. I thought the biggest danger from what I had read still came from Nazi Germany. Japan seemed an awfully far away place, and I thought the main test would come in Europe. But I felt an obligation, yes, a patriotic obligation to, uh, to join. I also wanted to demonstrate that I wasn't a slacker, that I wasn't a coward, that I wasn't afraid to lay my life on the line. Um, and so I decided to join the uh, uh, join up as a pilot. I had taken a course at Dakota Wesleyan civilian pilot training and had learned how to fly a little single engine plane, a little Iranka, and there were ten of us that took that course. And so the ten of us all decided we should sign up as pilots. <clears throat> well, you took the course not, not uh, expecting that something like Pearl Harbor would happen, you took it just because you, you liked the idea of flying? I took it because I thought the war clouds were gathering in Europe. We weren't yet involved. Uh, but I, uh, I thought there was a possibility, maybe even a probability, that sooner or later the United States would be drawn into that war. And I also was intrigued with the idea of flying. After all, out in South Dakota, we didn't see very many airplanes in those days, and we still had the image of Lindbergh. We still had the glamour of uh, going into the skies. And so there were a combination of reasons. <clears throat> there wasn't any Air Force then. There was the Army Air Corps and the Navy Air Corps. Ten of us borrowed two cars, one from the president of Dakota Wesleyan, one from the dean of Dakota Wesleyan, and took off for Omaha, where both the Navy Air Corps recruiting office and the Army recruiting office was. We weren't quite sure which one to join. When we got there, one of the guys picked up a rumor that if you went to the Army Air Corps recruiting office, they'd give you a free meal ticket to a downtown Omaha cafeteria. So on the strength of that unsubstantiated rumor and a meal ticket probably worth about a dollar, all ten of us joined the Army Air Corps. It's the cheapest I've ever sold out. <laughs> <laughs> it was still about a year or so, though, before, before you actually were taken. It was, uh, it was over a year, and the reason was we didn't have the training planes. We didn't have the training airfields. We didn't have the instructors. So I stayed in college until uh, mid-February of 43. We'd signed up right after Pearl Harbor, I think in the, in the early part of 42. And, uh, but we weren't called until February of 43, and then I had about a year and a half training uh, before I went overseas. I, um, we had a choice of either becoming fighter pilots or combat bomber pilots. I chose the bombers. Somehow those big four-engine birds that I'd seen fly over South Dakota a few times captured my fancy. And I decided that's what I wanted to do, and that's what I became. Wasn't there more glamour being a, a fighter pilot? The fighter pilots were more dashing. They maneuvered around. <clears throat> they could go into a near vertical dive, they could shift and turn. And to some people, uh, that had greater appeal. They weren't aloft very long at a time either. They'd run out of fuel uh, comparatively soon, whereas bombers could stay in the air for 10 or 12 hours. There was just something about getting behind that uh, steering gear of a big bomber with a crew of 10 men dependent on you that appealed to me. Maybe I'm a little slower than some of the fighter pilots. Uh, I greatly admired the American fighter pilots, including Joe Foss from my state, uh, later to become governor of South Dakota. He was one of the top fighter flying aces of the war. So I admired these men very, very highly. But uh, somehow the bombers appealed to my nature more than the fighters, and I'm glad that 
that was the path I took. The day you left, the day you were inducted or, or whatever, what did your parents say to you? There was a, a big rally at the Milwaukee Railroad Depot when I left for combat. The whole student body, I think everybody was there. The school band was there. The uh, cheerleaders were there. There must have been several hundred students and faculty at the depot to see Walter Kreiman, who had been the student body president, and I get on the train and head off for the Air Corps. He became a fighter pilot, I became a bomber pilot, but we were two of the better known men on campus, both of us sophomores. <clears throat> and um, everybody was celebrating. It was a kind of a festive occasion. The band was playing this peppy martial music. And then I saw my mother standing out there, tears just streaming down her face. It just broke my heart. I think my mother felt that she was looking at me possibly for the last time. And she was. She was old enough to know that it might be the last time. My father had a few tears in his eyes and he was comforting my mother. It took some of the joy out of this festive occasion off to war and down we go spouting our flames from under and so on, all the glamour. Uh, I'll never forget those scenes. When I came back after the war, a year and a half later, my father was gone. He had died at Christmas time uh, in 1944 while I was in combat. I didn't know he had died until the cable got there 10, years, uh, 10, uh, 10 days after his funeral. My mother was still alive, but um, of course joyful to, to see me. We also had a little baby born to my wife while I was gone. So the homecoming was happy, but it was marred somewhat by the absence of my dad, who I never saw after that sad day when I was leaving for the Air Force. We talked about this a little bit before. <clears throat> War is really a, a young person's game, isn't it? War is a young person's game, particularly for pilots. You have to be a little bit on the reckless side. You have to be a little bit on the emotional side to give yourself to a hazardous operation of that kind. And you have to have incredible physical energy and physical strength. A bomber pilot sits there at a four-engine four bomber. He has his right hand over four throttles to control those engines. He has his left hand on the steering uh, mechanism. These big four-engine bombers earlier on in the war were very difficult to fly physically. There was no hydraulic control system. It was like driving a Mack truck without any power steering, without any power brakes. And so you worked very hard physically for eight, nine, ten, sometimes twelve hours, holding that bomber in formation at high altitude and uh, watching the gas. We were always short on gas by the time we got home. <clears throat> that took, in my opinion, the physical strength, the physical energy of a young man. And it also took the, uh, the steely nerves and the, uh, as I say, almost a sense of reckless abandon in order to meet that task, yes. Uh, aerial warfare, and I think almost all kinds of warfare, requires youth and vigor and strength. No doubt about it. You also have to believe in your own invincibility, don't you? To a certain amount, you do have to believe in your own invincibility. There is a saying, probably doesn't make any, thing, make any sense, but we used to say, if it has your name on it, you're going to get it. If it doesn't, you're okay. And we always thought it didn't have our name on it. And yet, the evidence was all around. We'd see a bomber off our wing flying in formation over a target hit by an anti-aircraft shell, the bomber catching fire, then exploding when the fire hit the gas tanks, falling in pieces, no parachute seen sometimes. Or we'd see a bomber lifting on takeoff, loaded with high-octane gasoline, loaded with bombs, loaded with young men, people we'd had breakfast with before dawn, 
just a few minutes before, laughing and talking and betting whether the Cardinals or Yankees were going to win the World Series. And then 15, 20 minutes later, watch the plane ahead of us lift off, get a few feet off the runway, stall, crash, burn, little bits of burned flesh as big as a finger. Those memories stay with you. I thought I had forgotten all of them until Steve Ambrose wrote his book about the B-24s in World War II and made me the centerpiece of the book, my crew and, and me. But it, then those images began to come back and uh, it lets you know that you went through an awful lot in completing 35 missions. I frankly, in retrospect, don't know how we did it. I didn't know <clears throat> until I read Steve Ambrose's book when after he did his research at the Pentagon in the Air Force records, the Army Air Force records, I didn't know that half of the bombers, <clears throat> the B-24s that I was flying with, never, never completed their missions. The crews went down sometime during the missions. In fact, the average crew never got beyond 17 missions. You were only half through at 17 missions. You had to fly another 18 after that. I'm glad I didn't know that at the time, when I got to 17, if I'd have known that that's the time most crews ended up, I, it would have been a lot tougher to fly the remaining 18. This is going wonderfully, sir. Thank you.